Right, so let's just do a little housekeeping first. So turn off everything in the background like Skype or email or iTunes or whatever your thing is so that you minimize the possibility of being knocked out of the webinar. So silence your phone, close the door so you can focus on this and little kitties can't come running in. So, I mean, research shows that multitasking is overrated. So let's do one thing at a time. Now stay till the end, I've got a great bonus for you and we're going to have that live Q&A when you can ask me whatever you have doubts about. Now if by chance the sound disappears, and I know this has happened to me on other people's webinars, just refresh your screen or even sometimes just go right out and come back in with the same link. This can happen and I've got no clue why, but that's an easy fix. And just one other thing from my end, technology can fail, and it has failed before on my one of my webinars in particular, the whole computer crashed and that was panic stations. And because I hadn't warned anybody, when I came back, there was only like not even a third of the original people left that would given up on me because it takes a little while to reboot a computer. So if that happens, get a cup of tea, read a book or whatever, and just know that I'm doing everything possible to get back on. Right, today I'm going to teach you how to wrangle this demon called irritable bowel syndrome into submission and kick it into touch. There are 10 foods you must avoid that I want to go over that will get you on the right track. I mean, seriously, it's completely ridiculous for anyone today to be suffering from diarrhea, constipation, bloating, cramping from a wonky gut. So let's spread this information and get everybody sorted sooner rather than later. But first, who am I? Now, many of you probably know me from my blog, strandsofmylife.com, but some of you won't. So my name is Suzanne Perazzini, and I'm your IBS liberator. I'm a certified nutritional therapist specializing in IBS and a low FODMAP diet. I'm an award-winning author, a qualified teacher, and full-time low FODMAP diet coach. I've been featured on several podcasts, I've articles on numerous large health websites, and I've had many of my recipes published in hard copy magazines. Now, I've suffered from IBS all my life. I can remember as a child being obsessed with the toilet. And that's one of the first signs of IBS, by the way. Most people are not obsessed by the toilet, toilet apparently. So I just needed to spend plenty of time in the toilet doing my business. And I couldn't understand why my sisters could run in and out in a few minutes and it was all over. I mean, I'm still envious of people who can run in and out in a few minutes. But then I also wish that I could sing without scaring children. And that's not going to happen either. Although my sister, who's a good singer, swears that anybody can learn to sing reasonably well. I'm not so sure. Anyway, so I spent decades obsessed with the toilet, saying no to invitations that might expose my secret, because this is a secret affliction. It's embarrassing, for heaven's sakes. I went to so many health practitioners from the medically qualified to the more bizarre end of the spectrum with voodoo practices in an attempt to work out why I was so different from everybody else. Now, none of them had an answer, even though they all had an opinion, of course. If you pay money, and I spent a lot of money, they feel obliged to give you an opinion and to throw in some medication or obscure herbs, as you all well know. The number of times that I heard that I should be eating more fruit, vegetables, and fiber, I couldn't count on both my fingers and toes. And of course, we now know that that's the worst advice of all. But I kept going away and trying it over and over again. They say that if something's not working, then change it. So don't ask me why I didn't change it for so long. I guess I believe that they knew more than me, but I was wrong. And in the end, I had to do it myself. And thank goodness for the invention of the internet. 
So I Googled and Googled until the internet over the years caught up with what I needed. And eventually, I heard about the low FODMAP diet. Now, I ignored it at first, of course, like most of you have probably done, because it's a complex little beast to understand. I mean, lactose-free, give me that. That's easy. And I tried it for years. Unnecessarily, by the way, I don't have a problem with lactose. Gluten-free, simple. Cut out a few guilty grains, wheat, barley, and rye, and it's done. But FODMAPs are in nearly all foods. So we can't do a slash and burn on them, or we'd die from malnutrition. We'd end up just with protein, meats, and fat, and be eating like a dog. And we don't have the digestive system of a dog. It's complicated. It's about good foods and bad foods, yes, but it's also about amounts, combinations, and accumulation. I mean, heavens, who's got the time to work that all out? That's what I thought. And so I kept ignoring it. But one day, I was desperate enough to skip to a stop, and I actually read a bit further. And oh, heck, yes, that's what I needed. Darn it all. It had to be the most complex diet on earth, didn't it? So it began a time of intensive research and experimentation because this was before there was really very much out there at all. But I knew I was onto something and I can be pretty stubborn when I get my teeth into a project. So I persevered right through all the hiccups, the disappointments, while I figured it out. I didn't give up. On the diet and that's key. Now let's jump to today. My life has been completely revolutionized by this diet and also some other lifestyle changes that I've made. I used to sit in a crappy office with a cranky boss giving me headaches while trying to minimize my visits to the toilet because that's frowned upon. I mean in the corporate world productivity is the name of the game. Now I'm out of that, I can say that I was a mess back then, despite that smile on my face. I was barely hanging on by my back teeth. So I eventually sorted my health, and because I was finally getting the nutrients from the food I was eating, instead of passing them down undigested into the bowel where they caused all the problems, energy flowed back into my body and my brain. And so I was able to make the infinitely sensible decision to get the hell out of that office. And I now work from home as an online coach, teaching people how to implement this fabulous but complicated low FODMAP diet, and also on how to make those necessary lifestyle changes to support their IBS. I help people every day to become well. And I work with people from all over the world. I've had clients in India, Belgium, Colombia, Ecuador, Switzerland, and of course, many, many, many clients from the US, the UK, as well as Australia and New Zealand. And I now live my life on my own terms, and really all because of a little thing called the low FODMAP diet, which lifted an impossibly heavy burden from my life, IBS. I've got IBS just like you, and believe me, I know how you're suffering. Because if you're on this webinar with me, it's because you need some help. So you need help to get this monster off your back. It dominates your every thought, every decision, as it did mine. Once I was offered a job in a a great job in an architect's office. I just loved the idea of the job, but it was all men in this one open plan office and the toilet was based right in the middle. So they would see how many times I went to it, how long I spent in there, and I just couldn't bear the thought. Now I would stand up for myself and I would just let everybody know what was going on. But back then I was still in the secretive mode about it all. So I actually refused the job. And, you know, all I wanted was to be free of this humiliating condition. And I know you too as well. You want to be able to eat out with your friends and family without either causing a fuss or paying for a bellyache. Been there, done that, 
for decades. By the end of the meal being almost doubled over in pain. Just write in the chat if you know what I mean, if that's happened to you. Been out, all enthusiastic, dressed up, gone to the restaurant with your friends, and the evening ends badly. Just tell me in the chat if that's you. Meanwhile, that's my family, by the way. I thought I'd actually put one of my family instead of a generic one. That's my husband on the right, my mother next to him. Um, let's see, on the left, you can only see the side of his head, my son, who had that terrible motorbike accident. He can't turn his head now like he is there. My nephew next door, my sister with the sunglasses, my little grandniece is right at the end, and so on. And there's quite a few of the family up this part of the table that you can't see. Yeah, we've got plenty of people saying yes. <laughs> That it happens to you. I mean, what a shame to spend all that money and then you end up with a bellyache. Not fair at all. Now, I also know you want to be able to work and travel and simply lead a normal life. And I get it. Yep, that's me in Croatia. It was such a beautiful, beautiful scenery. We drove all the way along this coast, blue, blue waters and just rocks. So, you know, nothing lush, but the contrast was so strong. Now, I've traveled to over 60 countries, and this really there is there in front of you as well, if you can find the time and the determination to take the next step and to do this thing. Like I was, you're probably putting off committing because you're so busy. Maybe when the house has been renovated or the kids have left home or after Christmas. I got an email today from someone who says she's getting married in November. She'll do it after that. Meanwhile, she suffers. I mean, are you crazy? Why would you want to suffer even one day longer than necessary? We humans are so full of excuses why we shouldn't be taking action now. We all do it. It's even got a name, procrastination. It's the scourge of humanity, along with perfectionism, but that's a whole other story. Um, just very briefly, I have found a real connection between perfectionism and IBS. But as I say, that's another whole story. Now, all I'm telling you is that this can be done. And I did it and my clients do it. Now, here's an email from Sue, a client of mine, a little while ago. This is quite precious. I've been walking the dog without fear. Being fearless about going out is such a great feeling. I've been walking with confidence. Over the years, I've noticed my freedom slipping away and losing the ability to be outdoors has been a great loss to me. The freedom to be mobile again without fear is a prayer answered and so is this diet. I'm putting my health first, which is a rarity. I haven't felt this good in years. And most women don't put their health first, unfortunately. So you can eliminate your IBS symptoms. There's no cure, as you probably know. Though, so don't think that any of this is an elixir of, of exquisite delight. It's not. But we can control IBS instead of IBS controlling us. And that's massive. And you'd be surprised how fast it works if you've got the right guidance not to muck it up. I get emails every day from people who say they've tried the low FODMAP diet and failed, but it's because they haven't got all the little pieces of the diet in place, and that's so sad. I have no idea how many give up on the diet because they get it wrong. I'd probably be horrified because this can save you. Now, I forgot to mention, no, I didn't write at the beginning. I mentioned that there is a great bonus for you, but I'll tell you about that soon. So now, Let's dive into those 10 foods to avoid with IBS. And yes, probably what's in the picture is not a particularly good idea. So the first is high FODMAP fruits. Uh, but first I want to say something about the low FODMAP diet. It's not just a fad diet without any scientific basis like so many others on the diet, like the paleo, the SCD, et cetera. And I'm not saying those diets don't help some people. I'm sure they do. But they've got no scientific basis to them. This is the only one 
that's been scientifically proven to work. So the research team at the Monash University, they did a randomized, double-blind, placebo-based research study, and it showed that 75% of those with IBS are significantly helped by the low FODMAP diet. And the University of Michigan, just last year, they did their own comprehensive study and have reached pretty much the same conclusions. Not that I need that proof because I've got my own proof. It eliminated my symptoms and it's eliminated well over, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of my clients' symptoms as well. But it's always nice to know that science is behind us. Anyway, back to the high FODMAP fruits. We can eat many, many fruits like bananas, raspberries, melon, strawberries, kiwi fruit, oranges, etc. Careful with the oranges if you've got reflux, though. All the citrus fruits are not good for reflux. But we can't eat those that are high in FODMAPs like apples, pears, blackberries, mango, stone fruits like you know, apricots and peaches and cherries. Most of us, anyway, we eat our preferred fruits over and over again. It's not that we eat all of those fruits that I've mentioned good and not so good for us. So you shouldn't feel deprived. It just means that you have to make different choices from before. Eat the permitted fruits as widely as possible among them because we know that different colors give you different nutrients. So don't eat the same fruit over and over again, like a banana twice a day, every day. And the recommendation is to have two fruits a day. So maybe one for breakfast and one for one of your snacks, your morning snack or your afternoon snack. Okay. That's the recommended. Now, the second one I'm going to mention is high FODMAP vegetables. So these, the same as with the fruits, they all contain FODMAPs. So we can't cut them all out. And we have to divide them into those we can eat, the low FODMAP ones, like spinach, potatoes, zucchini, fennel, radishes, kale, pumpkin, etc. And divide them into those we can't eat, the high FODMAP ones like mushrooms, asparagus, cauliflower, garlic, and onions. They're the worst offenders, certainly are for me, garlic and onions. So make your choices wisely, eating the correct amounts, and make sure that you have five to six vegetables a day, but spread them out over your five small meals a day. Don't have them all at dinner or you'll get a bellyache. So have some for each of your meals, including your snacks, and you'll get in your five to six a day without overloading at any one time. Right, the third food or foods is wheat, barley, and rye. Now, all grains contain FODMAPs, but some more than others. We can have, for example, rice, polenta, quinoa, but not wheat, barley, and rye. They are high in oligosaccharides, which is one of the four FODMAP groups. The others being fructose, lactose, and polyols. But having said that, remember that we malabsorb FODMAPs, not that we are intolerant to them. So we could, for example, have the amount of wheat that's in breadcrumbs on a piece of fish without any problems. That's unless you're celiac, of course. I'm not talking about if you're celiac. If you're celiac, definitely don't do that. Now, a word of warning here. Gluten-free does not mean low FODMAP. Gluten is the protein that's in wheat, barley, and rye. But we malabsorb the carbohydrate part, not the protein part. The carbohydrate part is the fructans in wheat, barley, and rye. Gluten-free foods can contain high FODMAP grains like coconut flour, almond meal, soya flour. So if you remember nothing else, remember that gluten-free does not equate to low FODMAP. Not that you should be eating processed foods anyway. And we will get on to that. So the fourth 
is fat. Now, fat is a gut irritant, and the tolerable levels will be different for each of you. We need fat because every cell in our body requires it, so we can't cut it out completely and we can't go too low. But there will be a fine line between okay and triggering your symptoms, and you have to find out what that line is for you as an individual. It'll be different to mine. I mean, a drizzle, a drizzle of olive oil on a small salad could be okay, but perhaps deep fried chips won't be. And also, if you've had your gallbladder removed, which is, seems to be really common among my clients, then you have to eat even lower fat than all of us. Now, as I mentioned, I never advocate buying processed foods because of the additives that are often gut irritants, but they also can be quite high in fat, more than you can imagine. Now, as you can see my pretty picture there of salmon, it's a wonderful, healthy fish, but it's also very oily, so a lot of fat. And you have to watch how much you can eat before it causes issues. Now, salmon's got no FODMAPs, so you may think you can eat as much as you want, but you can't because of the fat issue. Now, I suggest around two ounces to start with, which in grams, I think it's about 60, 62 grams, something like that. And then build from there and just see where your tolerance level is. Because most of the protein meats, they've got no FODMAPs, but the recommended amount for us to have from a health point of view is four ounces. So I'm saying cut it in half to two ounces initially and see how you go. Now also peanut butter, it's low FODMAP, up to two tablespoons, but that amount would almost certainly cross that fine fat line. Don't let the FODMAP content dictate every choice you make with your diet. Fat is really, really important to take into account. I know my fat tolerance is pretty low. With peanut butter, I have about two teaspoons at a time, definitely not two tablespoons. And the salmon, I might cut it down even further than the two ounces, as much as I love it. Right, the fifth one, legumes and pulses. And they are lentils and beans, like black beans, chickpeas, navy beans, borlotti beans, butter beans, all those ones. Now these are high in oligosaccharides, just like the wheat, barley and rye. And the oligosaccharides, are not digested well by anybody in the population. But those of us with IBS, we just feel it much more dramatically because of our hypersensitive digestive system. And so we end up in pain with bloating, cramping, and so on. Now, having said all that, we can have half a cup of canned lentils as long as they're washed and rinsed, or a quarter of a cup of fresh. And why that amount is different is that the a lot of the FODMAPs have gone out into the liquid in the canned lentils. And if you wash them, rinse them, you're getting rid of those FODMAPs. So we can have double the amount, half a cup of canned, but only quarter of a cup of fresh. And we can have a small quantity of canned chickpeas as well. Same story, canned only, quarter of a cup. The fourth, of course, is lactose. That's one of the four um, FODMAP groups, disaccharides, uh, lactose. So that's the D in the word FODMAP. And it stands, sorry, so many people think that dairy is a problem, but it's not all dairy. It's only those that are high in lactose, like milk and yogurt. In fact, we can have certain cheeses, in particular the mature cheeses, and a few fresh ones like. We can have two slices of mozzarella, four tablespoons of cottage cheese, two tablespoons of ricotta. And that's because mature cheese is mainly fat. And those particular fresh cheeses, when they're made, there's a lot of excess liquid which is thrown away. And much of the FODMAPs are in the liquid, a little bit like with the lentils and, and the chickpeas canned. Now, casein is the protein in dairy. And it's not an IBS issue because it's not a carbohydrate. But that's not to say that you can't have a problem with it as an individual, because a small percentage of my clients have had an issue with both the lactis, lactose and the casein. But it's um, surprisingly not that common. 
to have the issue with the casein as well. And only 25% of people with IBS have a problem with lactose. As I mentioned before, I went lactose-free for decades in an attempt to sort my gut. And of course, what did I find? Lactose was not one of my triggers and I wasn't having it for decades and therefore caused some problems with osteoporosis because I wasn't getting my calcium. So do just check that out and make sure that you're not like me doing the wrong thing. Number seven, carbonated drinks like Coca-Cola, Fanta, soda water, etc. Carbonation is added gas, which we then introduce into the gut when we drink them. And this is going to irritate the gut and cause symptoms. We don't like gas in our gut. We feel it. By the way, this is the same with smoothies. The volume more or less, I don't know, doubles when you whiz up a smoothie. And that excess is added air, which we then ingest. And that's just not a good idea. Now, of course, on top of the carbonation in these drinks is the sugar levels, and it's far too high for us. And also, there's so many chemicals in them. And those additives are gut irritants and increase the hypersensitivity of the gut. And we already have a hypersensitive gut, so we don't want that. And then in drinks like Coca-Cola, there's caffeine, which is also a gut irritant. So you can get slammed from many angles with carbonated drinks. And yes, the, the diet ones are no good either because you've still got your carbonation, you've still got your chemicals and many artificial sweeteners, which I'm going to mention as number eight, are high FODMAP. And even those that are not, there's a lot of controversy over whether they're harmful or not. So stay away from carbonated drinks. And on to, as I mentioned, artificial sweeteners. Many artificial sweeteners are high FODMAP, in particular those ending in OL, like sorbitol, mannitol, xylitol. So if you're using products with artificial sweeteners in an attempt to avoid sugar, you are actually doing the wrong thing for your IBS. In fact, a certain amount of table sugar is okay on the diet because it's got equal quantities of fructose and glucose, and the glucose pulls the fructose cell by cell through the lining of the small intestine so that the fructose is absorbed. If there's an excess of fructose to glucose, as in most honeys, argave syrup, yacon syrup, then the excess is not absorbed. And that's what goes down into the bowel where it gets fermented and causes all your problems. However, we can't eat that much even of the safe sugars like table sugar or maple syrup because the glucose stops helping the fructose to be absorbed after a while and the rest goes down into the bowel to cause problems. So it's like the glucose just gets tired, fed up, throws up its hands in the air and says, I'm not doing this any longer and the rest doesn't get absorbed. So because of this, there should be very little added sugar in your meals. You can get it from two fruits a day. I'm not saying you can never have sweet treats. I'm all for sweet treats, but maybe not every day. And of course they have to be low FODMAP as well. This one, which I've mentioned a couple of times, processed food. Processed food contains chemicals as I've as I've said, and that's to improve the appearance, to improve the taste, to improve the durability of the product. But those additives are gut irritants. And they've, now we've had a research study that does show, as I mentioned, that they increase the hypersensitivity of the gut, which is exactly what we don't need. We can have single ingredient processed foods like rice, quinoa, table sugar, salt, etc but we can only have multi-ingredient processed foods if there are no additives. And if we recognize all the ingredients as food. So when you go shopping, stay around the outside of the supermarket where you will find all the fresh produce. You can make a quick run into the middle aisles for toiletries, cleaning products, and a couple of staples, as I mentioned, rice, salt, etc. But otherwise, stay out of them. Don't look at all those colorful packets and cans and 
boxes of food. If you turn around, look at the ingredients list, you won't recognize it all as food. Now we're actually up to number 10. Soya products. I get questions about this all the time, and it is confusing. So soya beans are an oligosaccharide, so they're high FODMAP. And you do have to be wary of eating them as a whole bean, like you can see in the picture. So, but let's look at a few individual soya containing foods like soya milk. It can be made in two different ways. It can be made from the whole bean, which contains high FODMAPs and so is not suitable for us, or it can be made from the soya protein alone. That's going to be fine because protein is not a problem for us. But it is extremely hard to find soya milk that's made from the soya protein. So normally I say stay away from it. Now soya sauce is okay at two tablespoons. So do add a bit of flavor to your food, your stir fries with soya sauce. Now tofu, especially for vegetarians, but also for meat eaters who want a bit of a rest from the meat. We can eat firm tofu only, two thirds of a cup. Because again, in the process of making the, the tofu, they, they squashed out, the, the FODMAPs are squashed out into the liquid and the liquid is tossed away, just like with the cheeses and the lentils, canned lentils. But on the other hand, if you've got the silken tofu, a lot of that liquid's still in there. All right, so that'll have a higher level of FODMAPs and should be avoided. So the firm tofu at two thirds of a cup. Now, soybean oil, it's a fat. Fat is not a carbohydrate. Fats are fine except for as a gut irritant, as I've mentioned, but they don't contain FODMAPs. There are no carbohydrates in it. So there's no real issue with that from your gut standpoint. Now, I'm not advocating or not advocating the use of soya products. I know there's a lot of issues about it being genetically modified. That's for a completely different um, webinar and not for this one. It's your choice to eat these products or not. But anyway, I hope that's kind of cleared up a few doubts for you, what you can and what you can't eat, where the soya products are concerned. So there, those are several of the foods and drinks to avoid. This is complex, but get it right, and you will experience a miracle. No more IBS symptoms, but no one says it's easy. So now you've got all that information, don't you dare make any more excuses that you can't do this. This will change your life and the life of your lives of your family, because don't think for a second that this doesn't affect everybody around you. I bet you're a cranky pants most of the time because you're either in discomfort or in out and out pain and you get your knickers in a twist about all sorts of things that are simple for other people like eating out, going for a trip, work events. A client of mine, Rachel, said this, after some convincing of my husband who realized how much I've been struggling to find things to eat, I joined the low FODMAP diet program and just the other day he said that it was life changing for me. Calm belly, calm mind. A happy spouse who doesn't want that. And I know this is hard for you and you've got no clue what to eat because you seem to react to everything you consume. It, it's really, really hard to figure it out because who would have guessed it's in so many foods our problem? You've got a busy life and you've got no time to think about creating a balanced IBS friendly meal. So much conflicting information out there exists that you've got no clue what's right and what's wrong. You're obsessed with food and about getting the diet right and the stress is making your symptoms worse. And if you don't learn how to eat well for your IBS, your health gets worse, you know. You can't starve your body of nutrients for too long before a whole raft of other health issues raise their ugly heads. Most of my clients have a long list of ailments that would fit an encyclopedia like fibromyalgia, reflux, 80% of those with IBS have reflux, depression, gosh, it could be as high as 80% again, gallbladder issues, and on and on. 
Um, so not surprisingly, many of these issues actually start to improve once the diet is corrected. And you make those lifestyle changes I've mentioned, like deal with stress, sleep enough, exercise, etc. We all know about those things. Now, Sylvia Vincent was a very grateful client. And she wrote this. Now I have a different toolkit that better suits the job. I've been able to repair and rebuild a very sick body, improve my mindset and family life. Saying I'm grateful is an understatement. And folks, as I said before, this all works like magic when you get it right. Now, wouldn't you just love to know exactly what to eat and when to eat it so you can create a safe routine your body loves? Wouldn't you love to be able to cook one meal for the whole family so that you can eat together with no fuss? And have a strong guideline that takes all the thinking out of meal planning so you can get on with life and never again have to doubt that what you are eating is safe so you can feel confident at meal times. And wouldn't you love to feel relaxed around food and your choices so that your anxiety disappears? Now let me ask you a question. Are you ready to be symptom free? Because not everybody is. Are you ready to be able to work, travel, play with your kids and socialize without being afraid, without eyeing up the closest toilet? I'm going to tell you how I can help you reach that place. No more fluffing around trying to do this by yourself, trying to figure out the amounts and combinations, all the various puzzle pieces that need to be slotted into place while you're still in pain. So how are we going to do this? Simple. I'm going to make you a customized meal plan based on your own personal likes and dislikes. A detailed meal plan for seven days. This will include delicious recipes for dinner each night, but if you're not a cook, then there's a simple alternative. I know some days you're just too tired to be creative, so that's fine. The simpler and cleaner we eat, the better, anyway. This will take all the thinking out of your meals. You will never have to wonder what you're going to eat again because I'm going to spell it out for you. But just a meal plan's not quite enough. So this five-part meal plan package includes a diary page for you to fill out each day so you've got a record of what you eat and how you feel after each meal. Get a shopping list that you can easily customize to your needs to make your shopping trips a smooth run and you don't get distracted by all those processed foods. And by the way, don't be hungry when you go shopping. It's disastrous. Also included is an accurate, up-to-date food chart with the amounts you can eat, of course. And even then, you might still have questions on how to actually implement all this. So I've included answers to almost any question you can ask me, seven pages of detailed notes, so that you can succeed at this right out of the gate. So let me just summarize that. Seven days of meal plans with recipes, a daily diary page, an accurate food chart, a shopping list with tickable boxes, and seven pages of planning notes. So how will this work? You fill in a questionnaire about your food preferences, other health issues, allergies, and lifestyle. I create a personalized seven day meal plan, especially for you based on the answers in the questionnaire. You receive your meal plans, shopping list, diary page, food lists, and plan to succeed notes within a week, but it's usually much earlier than the week. That's just to cover myself. But wait a minute, you may be worried about the fact that you do have other allergies like nuts, shades, nut shades, that's not that common, but it can happen, nightshades, you know, tomato, potato, eggplant, peppers. Or maybe it's casein and dairy. Well, there's a place in the questionnaire to tell me all about that. And if you've got other health issues, like many people with IBS do, then you can tell me all that in the questionnaire as well. So I've got you covered with all the different possibilities. And remember that bonus that I spoke about before. On top of the Meal plan package, if you purchase the package in the next 48 hours, we do have to put a limit to this, 
and you mention the webinar in your questionnaire. I'll include the PDF of my Low FODMAP Snacks cookbook, which sells on Amazon and on my website. So, how much is this five part meal plan package? I can hear you asking. It's just 49 US dollars. Now, you probably thought I was going to say hundreds of dollars, but just 49. I want you to get on the right path so that you can eliminate your bloating, your gas, your toilet issues once and for all. This is such a great way to start. And all you need to do is to go to that link there, ibsmealplans.com, and click where it says fill in the questionnaire. After you've completed that, you'll be sent to the payment page, and I'll be sent the questionnaire. Simple. And if you need to contact me at all to ask me any questions, that's my email, support at strandsofmylife.com. Now, just think about how much you've already spent on your IBS issues with no results. Probably thousands of dollars if you added it up. Probably more. More than you like to think. And I know you would spend that and more if you thought it would solve your gut problems once and for all. And this is a fabulous way to start for very little money. I mean, you'd probably spend $10,000, wouldn't you, if you thought you could get your health back and actually get relief. Anyway, so I'm doing this with $49, throwing in my snacks cookbook too, and you'd probably spend that on a week's worth of coffee, if you're a coffee drinker, and you will have to reduce your coffee intake, by the way, because the caffeine is a gut irritant. All right, now let me just read you a great quote by Albert Einstein, and I'm sure you actually all know. His definition of insanity was doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. You know that, but how many actually do that over and over again? It's time for you to make a change. Now you've got two choices. The first choice is to do nothing and keep suffering. Or well, the second choice is to take action today and get your life back so that your future is bright and unlimited. So at least you don't have, as we've said, this monster on your back. I mean, do you want to join the 75% of IBS sufferers who've done this diet and are now symptom free? So just do this, dive in, get yourself sorted, not just for you, but for your family and friends. Make a massive change in your life. A change that you will remember forever is the day that you took control of your health back. The first step is to get your own customized meal plan package. On to the Q&A. So any questions about anything I've said or about the meal plans? Does the meal plan work for families? Absolutely, Kylie. With all of my clients, I tell them, this is what the family eats especially for dinner. They can eat their high FODMAP foods during the rest of the day when people often eat splintered anyway and eat their own foods like for lunch and snacks. But for dinner, you make one meal. This is just food and it's delicious food. The recipes are absolutely delicious and everybody can eat it. So you have a daughter with Crohn's. This will be really good for your daughter with Crohn's. I've had several Crohn's clients and they do really well on it. And husband with joint inflammation issues which are under investigation, leaky bowel. Now leaky bowel and IBS are kind of the same thing. They come under the same umbrella. So again, low FODMAP diet, fantastic. So gluten intolerance taken care of, we don't eat wheat, barley and rye. And that's where you find gluten. So I was doing the two-week elimination diet, and at the end of the two weeks, I found I'd gained some weight. Is this common? No, actually, if anything, it's often the opposite. But your, your weight, it's about how much you eat or don't eat at the end of the day. And because we know what the upper permitted amount is for eating, you can eat less than that. So, for example, you're allowed to eat a, a cup of cooked rice or quinoa. You don't have to eat a full cup. You can eat half a cup. Just don't cut out any of the, the different food groups from a meal, but just reduce what you eat. But no, it's not that common, Irma. 
I'm confused, so confused about the fructose thing. Um, Tammy, can you kind of clarify what you mean by that? Fructose is one of the four FODMAP groups. It's the monosaccharide, so the M in the word FODMAP. And it's in many fruits and vegetables and in sweeteners, of course, as well. 45% of those with IBS have a problem with fructose. So 55 don't. Anonymous viewer, does the special include coaching? So the, the $49 doesn't include me directly, but I've given you those seven notes with all the information you need to implement it. But no, for $49, you don't get my coaching. Hi, is there a, a reintroduction stage with the diet or should the meal plan be followed for life? No, you should not stay on the elimination stage of the diet for life. You shouldn't stay longer than six weeks, actually, because it takes a lot of the prebiotics out from the diet. And prebiotics regulate the gut bacteria. So, um, and we need that regulated. Otherwise, you might feel better on the elimination diet. And if you stay on it over time, you'll start to get worse again because that bacteria, the gut bacteria is out of whack. So you do need to start the reintroduction diet. That doesn't go on a meal plan because it depends how you react to each test, what happens the next day. So that has to, with my clients, it's kind of layered over the top. We communicate each day about what to test next or when to stop and pause, etc. Is it rest of life? Some people say six weeks and then add triggers. So I think I've just answered your question there, Laura Lee. Sharon, is this a diet that has to be followed for the rest of our life? Same thing, I've just answered that. What's the difference between whey powder and whey protein powder? Presume the latter is okay. Yes, anything that's protein is okay because our problem is with carbohydrates. So protein is fine, but the whey powder will have lactose in it. We have a new picture of you. Okay, yes, yes. All right, let's just scroll down here. I've heard mixed ideas about chia seeds. Should they be a part of my diet? I have IBSD. If so, how should they be incorporated? Now, D, if you've got IBS with diarrhea, I wouldn't be having chia seeds, not necessarily, maybe a small amount. They're quite a good form of fiber for those with constipation. And it's something I do recommend for IBSD, uh, IBSC to have about a tablespoon of chia seeds each morning with your breakfast, soak them overnight in water or at least for 30 minutes just to make them more digestible. But if you've got diarrhea, you're not wanting to increase your fiber levels too much. So just play with that a little bit if you're wanting to have chia seeds. Would one cappuccino a day be okay? In my meal plans, I do allow one coffee or tea a day. Should be a little bit on the weaker side because there is caffeine in it, but hey, we're, we're humans, we need our comforts. Now the cappuccino, of course, would have to have lactose-free milk or one of the alternatives, but not soy milk. All right, wait a minute, I need to scroll down here to see what else we've got. So I've been using no lactose kefir to help with the probiotics. Kylie, absolutely, yes, if there's no lactose in it, go for it. Um, there's, there's not a lot of probiotics in something like kefir or even yogurt, actually, but we need the calcium, so have it anyway. How do I deal with constipation? See, that's my kind of IBS, by the way. Um, by increasing your fiber levels very gradually, and you can start with the chia seeds that I mentioned. Your next step, continue with the chia seeds, would be to add in some really good uh, grain like quinoa, which has got great fiber. It's also got protein in it. And just do this gradually, day by day. And maybe try some oats for breakfast, oatmeal. But it can be quite harsh for some people. So start really low. We already have to start low because it's only around about a quarter of a cup and the raw measurement is permitted before the FODMAPs are too high. So go easy on the oats, but it can be great for constipation and I have it every morning with a kiwi fruit because a kiwi fruit is a mild laxative as well. If you get really, really stuck once you've taken your fiber levels up and you hit that line where it tips over into symptoms, 
right? And you have to back off again and still your constipation's not great. Consider magnesium citrate. I take 100 milligrams every day and start very low because it is a laxative. Um, don't go for what the bottle says to take or you might spend the day in the toilet, which might feel great if you've got constipation, but that's kind of swinging from one side to the other, which isn't a brilliant idea. So, but always with things like that, just discuss it with your doctor, at least bring up your nurse so they can see what other medications you're on, what other conditions, health conditions you've got and can tell you whether that's all right for you or not. Should be fine, but I still would like you to check. All right. I read about the five to two diet, fasting two days a week, but IBS sounds like it helps many. When is the fasting okay? With IBS, we cannot fast full stop. We cannot do that. I don't care what other people can do, and maybe fasting is wonderful for them. But we can't do it because when the gut has been empty for longer than, say, three to four hours, it starts to accumulate gas. And for someone else, it doesn't matter. But for us, with our hypersensitive gut, we feel it. It blows out our gut. It causes the, the bloating because our gas, unlike somebody without IBS, accumulates in pockets. They've done a research study on this. We don't have any more gas than anybody else, by the way. But whereas a person without IBS, their gas is distributed throughout their colon and comes out in little puffs all day, ours accumulates in pockets so that when it comes out, moves down and comes out, it can come out and sound fairly explosive and it seems like we've got a lot more gas than anybody else. So we do not want to be accumulating that gas in our gut. Therefore, no fasting, no longer than three to four hours between meals. What alternative flours do you recommend to use instead of wheat, almond flour, coconut flour, gluten-free, all-purpose flour? Yes, mostly that's fine for most people, but they do contain gums, which can be a gut irritant. So just see how you go on a gluten-free, all-purpose flour, but check which flours are in there, that there isn't any of those ones I mentioned, a particular soya flour might be in there. I make my own flour mix, and I use rice flour, tapioca flour, and potato starch. Um, get those in the right proportion and they can create a, a great baking mix. Even things like pastry, I make pastry that stays together well, wonderful cakes. I use, what is it I do? I do one and a third cups of rice flour to a third of a cup of tapioca flour and a third of a cup of potato starch. And I buy those flours in an Indian shop where they cost a fraction of what they cost in a health shop like a big bag for about a dollar. So, and most Asian shops will be the same, not just the Indian shops. All right. Other than rice, potatoes, protein, and bananas, what foods would help with diarrhea? If you are eating only low FODMAP foods, you won't get diarrhea. The good news for those of you with IBS with diarrhea is within a couple of days on the correct diet, 100% accurate low FODMAP diet, the diarrhea disappears, gone. It's like magic. Those with constipation, it takes a little longer because we need to layer um, that fiber increasing diet on top. And that can take a week or two to get that right. But within a couple of weeks, my client, sorry, a couple of days, my clients don't have diarrhea. It's as horrible as it is, it's the easier one to have when you go onto this diet. So you will not need to stick to um, things like rice and potatoes and bananas. Um, they are the right foods to have if you're in the middle of an episode. Absolutely have them, maybe some chicken, the, the protein that you mentioned there. But you won't need to be doing that any longer once you're on an accurate low FODMAP diet. <sighs> What are your thoughts on supercharged food powder? Equals Healy, that may be for. Um, I don't know that specific product, but as I said, let's not go near any processed foods or as we can call them, multi-ingredient foods. You would have to be looking through every single ingredient and checking that it was low FODMAP. Um, and I, I do that for my clients. They send me snap photos of different things and I tell them. I can't imagine if it's called supercharged 
that it would be um, any good for us. It'll be high FODMAP, possibly with a lot of fruits and vegetables in there, in the powder form. So not recommended at all. If you eat an accurate low FODMAP diet, your energy levels will shoot up. It's one of the first things my clients say is how their energy levels have improved on the diet. And it's because you're actually absorbing the nutrients from the food you're eating instead of them bypassing the small intestine where they should get absorbed and going off down into the bowel and not getting absorbed, getting fermented down there. Um, is your flour mix, is that brown rice flour or just rice flour? I use white rice flour, but certainly use brown rice flour if you want to. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, if you've got IBS with diarrhea, perhaps the white rice flour would be better for you. If you've got it with constipation, the brown rice flour might be a good idea. What are your thoughts on slippery elm bark powder to release tummy pain? Um, I don't have any real thoughts on it or any of those products. The, the idea is to prevent that happening with the low FODMAP diet. Once you've got it, there's very little you can really do except for wait it out, knowing that you can get back on track because you've got the information you need to stay on track with a really good meal plan. We all make mistakes and sometimes it can take a couple of days to get back to where we were, but know that you will get back to it. They won't for sure have tested slippery elm bark powder, so we don't know if it's high or low FODMAP. But look, once you're symptom free, with the right meal plans, then you can test something like that and see if it works for you or not. I've been tested and have casein intolerance, but I'm not intolerant to lactose. Does that mean I can't have dairy whatsoever? As far as I know, that means you can't have dairy because I can't think how they'd be able to take the protein part out of dairy. The only way that they're able to neutralize the lactose is they add the lactase enzyme to the milk or the yogurt to neutralize it. I don't think they can do that with the casein. So that is unfortunate. Yes. All right, anything else here? Is, I can never say that word, Jan, asafetida. I know what you're talking about, the onion substitute that smells really bad. How much do I use to say a pound of <coughs> ground beef? I'm not too sure. I'm, I think we're talking about pinches of it. And yes, it is fine in very small amounts. But I don't use anything like that. I actually just use the green part of spring onions. It gives the flavor and um, doesn't cause a problem. And just a little tip about spring onions, because I know it feels funny that you use the green part and throw away the white part. Don't throw it away. Put it in a glass of water, the, the green part, with a few bits of green left on it in a glass of water, and in no time, it'll sprout new green leaves. So I can keep one bunch of spring onions for about a month. After about a month, the, the green leaves start to look a bit yellow as they come through, and I think it's because there's no nutrients in the water, not enough nutrients for them. But it means that I only buy one bunch of spring onions every couple of months. So the white's not wasted from that point of view. I also use the green part of leeks, by the way, but I'm not sure what to do about the white part. The gut healing powder is not a food, but a gut healer. Specific people of IBS, not a food, can be purchased through superchargefood.org. I've purchased through my health shop. This heals your gut, Anna. Okay, as I say, a lot of these things are out there being sold as um, healing guts. We don't need to heal our gut if we don't have IBD and inflammatory bowel disease, we've got nothing physiologically wrong with our gut, with the IBS. So there's no healing that happens. We just need to avoid the foods that bypass the small intestine and get fermented in the gut, in, in the bowel. And we also have to avoid the gut irritants as well. Um, so if you want to, on my, uh, either in my Facebook group or on my website, on the FAQ page, in the comments, if you want to ask that question, I'll pop on line and have a look at the ingredients for you and tell you what I think. Okay, so I hope that has been helpful for you. I'll be waiting to see who's ordering a meal plan. This is a fantastic way for very little money to just start yourself on the road to 
fit in good health. And if you follow these meal plans 100% accurately, you're going to see an enormous difference within a week. But it's a way to do it by yourself, but with some help from me um, to get you started. I'm going to say goodbye. Thanks so much for um, joining me on this webinar. As always, it's great to be able to answer your questions at the end. And thank you for watching and listening and goodbye.